Listen, I'm so excited to be with you. Third service. I'm, I'm just excited for what God is doing here at Adventure Church. It's incredible to think about uh, just all that, that God has done in such a short period of time. I remember when Pastor Kyle first would come down with a group of volunteers to the block parties that we would host in Columbus through the Columbus Dream Center and he was always the grill master. He was always the one uh, working the hot dogs and making sure everybody got fed. And, and, and very early on, he said, there's going to be a dream center in Delaware. And, and that's the kind of pastor that, that you have. He sets his heart and his mind to the vision of the Lord. He's so eager to see the kingdom of God break out in this city of Delaware. And when he sets his heart to something, it happens. And so you truly are, are honored and, and privileged to be able to call him your pastor. And I want to acknowledge my brother, Nathan Gordon, his beautiful wife, Kirsten, uh, that lead the, the Delaware Dream Center. Let's give it up for them. Kirsten was a part of the, the school of ministry um, that, that uh, Pastor Chad was talking about. And, and Nathan, his, his father, Chris Gordon, he's the executive director of the Dream Center. Nathan got back from Bible college out of Florida and uh, I was sitting in my office at the Dream Center and Chris opens the door and he's like, Gerald, this is Nathan. Nathan, this is Gerald. And he shut the door. And so I was like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess we have to be friends. Uh, but it's been amazing to see how God has, has raised Nathan up uh, to be such an incredible kingdom leader. You know, when I was driving here, I really felt that the Lord spoke a simple verse that he wanted me to declare over, over you guys. Um, finding out about Pastor Kyle and and him being tested positive for COVID and knowing that there's others, I'm sure, who, who are either overcoming COVID or just going through other struggles, other obstacles in your life. I felt so strongly the, 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 the whisper, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit that, that said that God, Jesus himself, his strength is increasing in the hearts of, of this church. Individually, your families, your marriages, kids, students, that, that, that the strength of Jesus is increasing in the hearts of Adventure Church. I want to take you to a verse. Psalm 118, verse 14. And this is not a part of my message. So this does not count against my time. Okay? <laughs> but Psalm 118, 14 says this, the Lord is my strength and he is my song and he has become my salvation. Would you just close your eyes with me? I just wanted to declare this over you. Lord, you know what your sons and daughters are experiencing, what they're facing Monday through Saturday. Lord, you know who is overcoming COVID, who is overcoming financial hardship, whatever it may be. And I, I just pray right now in this moment, by way of your spirit, that they would identify with the strength of the Lord that is rising up on the inside of them. Not their strength, but your strength. Give them the courage in Jesus' name to identify with the truth that your grace is sufficient, that you are strong in them, and that your strength is increasing. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You have an awesome team here. When I got the text from Pastor Kyle, I was sure that I was going to preach a message out of 1 John chapter 1. Our church has been through a series where we've unpacked the entire book of 1 John over this summer. Uh, we meet twice a month in person. Uh, we call them our worship celebrations, the second and fourth Sunday. And then the first and third Sunday, there's about 10 home churches that are spread out through Columbus. And so I knew it would be perfect because we'd have six Sundays, June, July, and August, to go through the book of 1 John. And so we did an introduction uh, message, just unpacking the background, the historical context of the book. And then we, we unpack chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, those five chapters in the book of 1 John. And it was awesome. And I loved it. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into 1 John chapter 1. There's only 10 verses. I'm going to take that to Adventure Church, and we're just going to dive into that. And I was ready to go. My brother Jacob was driving me up here and I was going through the message on my iPad. And literally, by the time I was done going through the notes from that message, I heard the Lord say, yeah, you're not preaching that. And I'm convinced he does that to us pastors just to keep us on our toes, just to see if we're leaning in. And so I got here this morning and I told the media team, I'm like, um, all those slides that you were probably putting together last night, because I didn't send you my outline until like eight o'clock, you can go ahead and delete all of those. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing a whole 
another message. And so I'm excited uh, to be here. Again, this is the third service and I've been blessed by the testimonies already from those who have just shared their gratitude for switching the message and uh, how this message has spoke to them. You know, when I was, when I was leaning into that verse um, out of Psalm 118, you know, I, I want to just put this in our, our mind and our, in our, in our consciousness when you think about the strength of the Lord in this hour, I, I want us to be honest. If any of us were told in March of 2020 that a year and a half later, we'd still be wearing masks some places, we'd still be closed down some places, that schools would be tr trying to figure out for the second school year, can we meet every single day? If we would have been told that a year and a half later that we would still be experiencing the effects of this pandemic, all of us would have said, you're absolutely crazy. There's no way it will last that long. And, and let me make this very clear. I am by no means suggesting that God sent COVID, but I am telling us, and I do want us to be aware that he's sovereign over it and that he's using it for his purposes. And I believe one of the things that, that he's using it for is to strengthen his church, to purify, refine, and prune his church. I'm, I'm fully convinced of that, fully convinced of that. And that's good news for us. But in his mercy and his grace, he redeems everything. The worst days of our lives as a believer are useful in the hands of the Lord to bring us into the image of his son. This is good news. I don't know about you, but over the last year and a half, there's been some leaning in, some pressing in that I've had to do that, that is a little bit different than what these last 12 years of following the Lord have looked like in my life. And so I just want you to be encouraged, whatever you are going through, whether it's because of this pandemic, whether it's because of financial hardship, whatever it may be, as a believer, your worst days are useful in his hands. And he's working everything together for the good or those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And in, in that chapter of Romans 8, Romans 8, what's the context? Being conformed to the image of his son. And I want to talk about the Garden of Eden today and make the connection here that God from the beginning had a desire and a dream for us to reflect his image and his likeness. And he's never changed his mind about it. And in switching to this message, it's actually going to be the first message that I preach in a new series that we're starting at Garden City next Sunday. And you get to hear it first. We get to work out all the kinks and then be ready to go next week. But, but what the Lord invited us to do is to take this time, this, this fall season. I look at fall more as the new year than I even do January. You know, we're coming back to school. At least my kids are going back to school. You know, summer's over. It's the Jewish new year. Rosh Hashanah is actually tomorrow. This is like a, a fresh start in many regards, the fall season. And for us, it's going to be a time that we really lean into what is the mission and the vision of, of, the, of our church. And it's called Garden City for a reason. And we're going to talk about the four gardens that I feel like the Lord has invited us to lean into to have a, a, a more clear understanding of what it is that he's inviting us to align with and to agree with. And, and this is for every believer. There's several gardens or dwelling places that we see throughout the Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. We're going to talk about four of them. The first will be the Garden of Eden, and then the second will be the New Jerusalem, the Garden City that Revelation 21 talks about, that will descend from heaven, and he will be our God, we will be his people, and he will dwell with us forever. That's where this thing is going. But if we're going to identify with the gospel that restores us to what God desired in the Garden of Eden, and that points us to the Garden City, New Jerusalem, I believe there was two other gardens that had to be addressed. The temple garden. We see at the, the climax of Israel as a nation, King David gets this vision to build God a temple. And he's not allowed to build it. He passes those blueprints down to his son Solomon. And you can read about this in 2 Kings 6.29 that the, the designers of the temple were told to inscribe cherubim or angels open flowers and palm trees on the walls of the temple. This is so amazing. That means every time the priests would come into the temple, they were being called back to the Garden of Eden. 
The open flowers, the palm trees, the angels were meant to provoke them to recognize that this was a picture pointing them back to what God originally designed and desired in the garden. Isn't that amazing? And so when you think about that, it it, it speaks to, as the people of God, we too, now that we have been brought into this covenant relationship with God, are meant to identify with what it looks like to live and to identify with the fellowship that comes through the presence and glory and spirit of God. So that's where the temple garden comes in. But then the other one that we have to address is the garden of Gethsemane. Because so much of life, so much of life is predicated on learning how to triumph through tears. And we see Jesus model that in the garden of Gethsemane. Three times, take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. I love the humanity of Jesus in that scene that the gospel writers didn't erase that part of the story. Three times Jesus asked the father to take the cup of suffering from him. And I believe every time that he was saying, take this cup in that vulnerability, in that humility, as a son, it was building up in him the grace to say, not my will, but your will be done. And there's so many lessons that we can learn from identifying the invitation to meet Jesus in the garden of crushing, the garden of crushing of Gethsemane, the wine press, the olive press. But today we're going to talk about the Garden of Eden. And I pray that it will be a blessing to you. So Father, would you pray with me? Father, we we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for your life-giving spirit. And, And we're asking you by way of your spirit to open up Genesis chapter two in this moment, to open up our eyes, our heart, to what it is that you desired and designed from the beginning and that would impact our lives tomorrow and through the week, that it would, that would give us a new lens and paradigm to look through. Lord, as we raise our families and as we work our jobs and as we engage in the community here in Delaware, God, we're asking you to give us a deep love for what you wanted And that the gospel of Jesus Christ has given us access to and has restored us to. We thank you for that today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So let's jump right into this. The Garden of Eden, falling in love with God's dream and design. So if you haven't known this about pastors, we love alliteration. Using words that start with the same letter to help us stay on track and stay on on topic with our messages. And so I want you to consider that God's dream and design, we can see it clearly in these first few chapters of the Bible. I want to suggest to you today that the Bible is primarily about God himself and his glory in the earth. And it's really, really good news that God is primarily concerned with him being glorified, with with himself being known and glorified in the earth. That's good news for us. We are the direct beneficiaries of his focus of seeing his glory made known in the earth. This is the third service. So I'm going to add some other scriptures that I didn't add in the first two. You can leave whenever you need to. Habakkuk 2.14 says that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now, I remember the first time that I read that verse, my mind immediately went to Isaiah 6, where the prophet is standing there and he sees the train of the robe of the Lord fill the temple and he's seen this scene of what's going on in heaven and the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, now, wait a second. If Isaiah is saying that the whole earth is full of his glory, what's Habakkuk talking about in Habakkuk chapter 2, 14, when he says that coming in the future, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There's one verse that distinguishes, one word rather, that distinguishes those verses. Knowledge. What Isaiah was understanding already exists in the earth, 
God's glory already being in the earth. Habakkuk was saying, but there's coming a day where the knowledge, the awareness of his glory will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. In other words, he's saying there is coming a day where you will not be able to walk on the earth. And I believe he's talking about the new heavens and new earth. There's coming a day where you will not be able to be on this planet and live disconnected or unaware of how glorious God is. Oh, I long for that day. It won't be reduced to a Sunday service or Christian activities, but you will not be able to ride a roller coaster. You won't be able to walk your dog. I'm just guessing that this stuff will be in the new heavens and new earth. You, you won't be able to do anything in the new heavens and new earth and not be 100% aware of how glorious he is. That's good news. That's good news. But what informs this being the heart of God? I believe it's the Garden of Eden. We see so clearly. But as I mentioned, this is what the Bible is pointing to. I, I want to suggest to you that there is an invitation that every time you open this book, that you do it with the motivation that I want to encounter God. I want to see his ways, his purpose, his plan. I want to come into the revelation of his nature and his character. I want every verse to point me to his son, Jesus Christ. And yes, I agree with the acronym that the Bible, in addition to all of that, is filled with the basic instructions before leaving the earth. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that we can't approach it that way, but I'm just saying there's a greater invitation than reducing it to that alone. It's to encounter the author and to fall in love with his dream and design for humanity and creation and to understand that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of his blood and resurrection, you get to participate in that incredible redemptive narrative now. You're not only the beneficiary of it, you get to help make it happen. And if you're not already convinced of that, I hope you will be by the end of this message. So when we look at the Garden of Eden, I want to give you an invitation. as one of the, the things that, I, that I'm hoping you see clearly. As we look at the Garden of Eden, you'll see that you were purposed in pleasure. That as, as human beings, we were purposed in pleasure. You say, well, why, why do I say that? Well, we're going to find that God himself is the creator, the designer, the visionary of both creation and humanity. All that we see and know God permitted. Then he said and let our phrases that are mentioned at every turn and our new day of the creation narrative, everything that we see comes forth from him and what he permitted to be. And out of everything that God created, it is the man is the only thing that God formed and breathed into. When you look at the rest of the creation narrative, it says that God created. But when it gets to man in Genesis 2, 7, it says that God formed. Now, all, all I want to point out is that the difference between created and formed is that formed is a higher degree of intimacy. That there was a higher degree of intimacy that went into forming man that you don't read about and the rest of what he created. Let this set the tone for how close, how near that he breathed his breath of life into our nostrils. That picture alone just moves me. Let that set the tone for how close, how near he intended to be to us from the beginning. God created man with purpose for a purpose, and that's what we will see clearly in relation to the Garden of Eden. Let's jump into the first verse that I want to unpack. Genesis 2, verse 8. It says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. There's three things that we learn just in this verse alone. The first verse where the Garden of Eden is mentioned. Number one, the Garden of Eden was planted or established by God himself. In other words, Adam didn't plant the garden. God did. We see here that the first gardener was the Lord. So you gardeners out there, you're doing one of the things that the Lord loves to do, planting gardens. I think that's kind of cool. 
But what's significant about this is everything else in the heavens and the earth had been created, but yet he zooms in and he says, okay, I need to create a specific place that I'm going to put man. He didn't just haphazardly put man somewhere, but he said, no, I'm going to create a specific habitation from which I want man to live. Number two, Eden is a Hebrew word that means pleasure. Eden is a Hebrew word that means pleasure. So the Lord is the gardener, the planter of pleasure. That's what he chose to plant. Garden of pleasure. Number three, the Lord saw fit to put, to establish, to appoint, and to ordain man in the Garden of Eden. So what's the first takeaway? We were not created to identify our purpose separate from the pleasure of God. You were not created to pursue or identify with what it is that God is calling you to, the assignment on your life, separate from intimacy, fellowship, living in and from pleasure and satisfaction with the Lord himself. I want that to sink in today. So here's my question for you. Are you pursuing your purpose disconnected from experiencing pleasure in the Lord? Are you pursuing your ministry? Are you raising your children? Separate from living in and from satisfaction, pleasure, intimacy, and fellowship with God. I love the book of Psalms. You cannot read the book of Psalms and not see this invitation perpetually. I think of Psalm 1611. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures eternal pleasures forevermore. I think of Psalm 36 verse 8 where we're invited to drink from the river of his pleasures. I don't even know what that means but it sounds real good. And if that's the invitation I want that. You mean there's a whole river flowing of the pleasure and delight of God that we've been invited to drink from? That's just worth pursuing. I think about the invitation of Psalm 63, 3, where the psalmist says, God, your loving kindness is better than life. So because of that, my lips will praise you. Now he is God almighty. He can and does demand praise, but he prefers a praise that is the result of you actually experiencing his loving kindness being better than anything this life has to offer. Now I want to set some people free today. You're hearing me say that, maybe you've read that verse, but if you're honest this morning, you have not experienced that. You cannot stand up here if I were to give you the microphone and say, yeah, I've come into an experiential reality that God's loving kindness is better than anything that this life has to offer, better than success, better than a all expenses paid vacation to Hawaii better than whatever your dream may be. There's some of you who could not honestly say that you experientially have come into a fellowship with God that would provoke you to confess that his loving kindness is better than anything that this life has to offer. So what do you do about that? You're honest. And you come before him and you say, God, well... If Psalm 63, three tells me that your loving kindness is better than life, then by faith, I believe you. And I'm asking you to bring me into an experiential reality of that. I'm not going to pretend or fake or lie that I'm finding my full satisfaction in you, God. In fact, there's a lot of other things that I prefer to do than to spend time with you. And I think for a lot of us, if we were to be told in advance that a pandemic was coming that was going to make us have to stay in our home, we would have said, you know what, if I had nothing to do with my time other than to be with the Lord, if I just had the time to do that, I would do it. How many of us maybe would have said that before March of 2020? If I just had more time, I'd spend it with God. If I just had more time, I'd get in my word. If I just had more time, I'd pray more. And we all can take inventory and see if, if that was true. 
I know for me, there was a lot of Netflix watching. I caught up on some good series and, and movies. I'm not preaching at you. I'm, I'm just sharing with you an invitation that even I every day have to continue to say yes to and ask God to make real to me all over again. He's our daily bread. You weren't meant, I feel the Holy Ghost. You weren't meant to be satisfied off of yesterday's encounter. You were meant to come back for fresh bread every day. I think about Psalm 65 verse four, where the Bible says, blessed is the man that you cause to approach you, that he may be satisfied of your goodness and in your holy temple. What's the significance of that verse? God is the one that causes us to approach him. You can't love God. I can't love God without God. We can't worship God without God. We can't obey God without God. What does Jesus teach us in John 15, 5? Apart from me, you can do nothing. That includes loving him, obeying him, and serving him. But why do we try so hard to do those things without him? I believe that the increase of love and obedience and surrender is the overflow of experiencing his love and his pleasure and his satisfaction. Brokenness, pain, hopelessness are often the result of seeking satisfaction outside of God. Many of us would say that the biggest problem for the believer is sin. I believe sin is a symptom of a bigger problem. We don't trust God to satisfy us. So we take responsibility for our own satisfaction. Because we aren't convinced that God is trustworthy to be the one to satisfy us. I believe so many sin cycles would be broken if we focus primarily on coming into a rhythm with God that he became the source of our satisfaction. And experientially, we were able to acknowledge, wow, you really are better. Your tangible pleasure and satisfaction is better than anything this life has to offer. Garden City, one of our missional words that helps, helps us recognize what we feel God is calling us to do and establish is communion with the Lord. And we say that our greatest pursuit is to be with Jesus. And everything we are called to do and be is meant to be out of the overflow of that communion and fellowship with him. Preaching to the lost, evangelizing, serving the poor. I don't care what it is. It was all meant to be done out of the overflow of first coming in to deep fellowship, intimacy, satisfaction, and pleasure with the Lord. Amen? You guys doing okay? Let's go on to Genesis 2, 10 through 14. It says, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Avila where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. Bedlam and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gahan. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittichel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. And there's a whole lot that I could unpack within these four verses, but here's just the big picture point that I want to give you. Four rivers proceed from the Garden of Eden that bring life and prosperity to the surrounding lands. The meaning of these four rivers is increase, bursting forth, rapid, and fruitfulness. That from this place where there was perfect intimacy and fellowship, man experiencing the pleasure and satisfaction of God in this garden, this garden of pleasure that he created, bursting from that place are these rivers that are bringing life to the surrounding areas. It makes me think about Ezekiel 47 where the prophet is catching a glimpse of the restored temple and breaking from the threshold of the temple. Outward is a river of life that is bringing dead things back to life. A river that is touching the dead, dry, and dark places outside of the temple. And wherever this river flows, dead things come to life.
That's the picture of Ezekiel 47. It makes me think about the words of Jesus pertaining to you and I. In John chapter 7, verse 37, where on the last day of the great feast, he stands up and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he doesn't say, I'll give you a cup of water. But what he says is out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. What's he speaking of? The Holy Spirit. Why? Because we're now the temple. You and I are now the temple of the living God. You and I are now the ones who the Holy Spirit, the glory of God, resides in. And in the same way that these rivers are flowing from what I believe is the first temple, the first sanctuary, the Garden of Eden, in the same way that the prophet Ezekiel sees this river flowing from the threshold of the temple in Ezekiel 47, we are now the temple of God and out of the overflow of our communion and fellowship and identifying with the pleasure and satisfaction that we were created to experience in Him, it should be producing living waters Rivers of living waters that are flowing from our lives, touching the dead, dry, and dark places around us. This is what you're called to. This is what I'm called to. And so the question that, that I have for you, as the royal priesthood of God that you are, you know that this was the first title that the children of Israel were given after being delivered from Egypt, a kingdom of priests? Exodus 19, verse 6. And it was the whole nation. It was the whole nation. God wanted to encounter them and raise them up to be a kingdom of priests unto him, a special possession unto him that all the surrounding nations would see the goodness of God as it's manifest through a people who identify with what it looks like to host his presence and experience satisfaction and pleasure in him. But upon this invitation, the children of Israel said, nope, there's some lightning and thunder and some smoke going on up on that mountain. Moses, you go and talk to God and then you come back and tell us what he said. And we're still doing that today. The man or woman with the microphone was not meant to go to God and then tell the congregation what he said. I should be encouraging you, Pastor Kyle should be encouraging you within the realities of what you're already hearing God speak as you read the word for yourself, as you go to him in prayer for yourself. You have just as much access to God as anybody who holds a microphone. But the children of Israel said, we don't want to come that close to him. Moses, you go for us, report back to us what he said. And in God's mercy, he raised up a tribe, the tribe of Levi, and he instituted the Levitical priesthood. That was not his original plan. His original plan was for the entire nation to be a kingdom of priests unto him. Is this all right? It's my only message today, so. <laughs> but we don't see it end in Exodus. We see in 1 Peter 2, 8 and 9, again in the New Testament, we're called a royal priesthood. We see John the Revelator in the full understanding, the full revelation of Jesus' victory what are you and I called in Revelation 5, 8 through 10? Kings and priests who will rule and reign with Jesus in the new heavens and new earth. He has not changed his mind about what he wants. So here's the question. Are the places you have been given influence, your family, your job, your neighborhood, are they reaping the blessing of your fellowship with God? Can you identify the rivers of life touching the dead places around you that are the result of the intimacy with God that you are walking in as you identify with your call to be a part of the royal priesthood, carrying the Holy Spirit in the glory of God everywhere you go. What does this look like in your life? And if you need some scripture references as to you being the temple, go read 1 Corinthians 3.17 and go read 1 Corinthians 6.19. Practically, I think a great place to start, if you haven't, is the Delaware Dream Center. That's serving this community, bringing the spirit of life bringing the glory of God that you walk in relationship with, that you live in intimacy with daily and bringing it to the community, believing that rivers of life will touch the dead, dry and dark places and bring them back to life. 
Genesis 2.15, the Bible says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to do two things, to tend it and to keep it. Now again, God had already commuted man, communicated man's purpose in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. There's two things I believe that he's emphasizing. Let us, one of the first pictures of the Trinity, if not the first, let us make man in our image and likeness. That's speaking specifically about the nature and character of God. His glory being made known as he sees his reflection in us. And then secondly, to walk in dominion and authority throughout the earth. But again, God did not want Adam to identify with that purpose separate from the specific place of pleasure that he was being planted in. Carrying this purpose out would start by man stewarding a specific place, the Garden of Eden. Tend means to work and or to serve. Keep means to guard, observe, or to watch. So Adam was told to tend the garden and to keep the garden. Here's the big picture idea here. Work is sacred and holy. In its original form, it's sacred and holy, and it was always a part of God's plan. Working in the garden was a responsibility given to man that came with great fulfillment and satisfaction. And I want to suggest to you that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, satisfaction and fulfillment in the context of your work has been restored. This sacred secular divide that so many Christians have been duped to believe it's not biblical. My Bible says in Psalm 24 that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, every one and everything. In other words, Sunday is no more holy than Monday through Saturday. And you as a lawyer, as a doctor, as a mechanic, as a stay-at-home mom, as a dog walker, come walk my dog, as a dog, whatever it is, you were called to do whatever it is that you're putting your hands to Monday through Saturday with the expectation through Christ to, to find deep satisfaction and fulfillment in that work. And to do it as unto the Lord. I believe this is the first picture of worship. And there's no song. There's no bass. There's no electric guitar. There's no drums. But it's humanity walking in intimate fellowship with God. Tending to the garden. Keeping the garden. And finding deep satisfaction and fulfillment in their work. Are you experiencing the beauty and delight and satisfaction of the work that you've been called to? Is it being done in and through intimate fellowship with God? Do you see your work as worship or do you wait to worship on Sunday? Do you identify with the influence and the authority that you have? There's people that you have influence over and with that Pastor Kyle and Chad never will. I got a little bit of time. When I worked at Chase from 2010 to 2012, you see, I never wanted to be in, in, in the local church as, a far, as far as my occupation. My dad was an assistant pastor at a small church in Columbus. He oversaw the finances. He ran the discipleship classes. He cared for the senior adults while working a full-time job at Check Free, which is now Fiserv. And, you know, I just remember him always getting the short end of the stick. And I won't unpack exactly what I mean by that. I just saw enough of the behind the scenes that I'm like, yep, not doing that. I had a, a desire for entrepreneurship. But my first real estate property at 18 years old Ended up at Chase, just wanted the temp position. They hired me to be the senior loan processor uh, for refinancing. I had no clue what I was doing, no college degree, but I could sell. And that's what I found out is what they were looking for. And by the age of 20, I was making six figures at, at Chase. And as awesome as that, that was, you know what brought me so much fulfillment? I heard the Lord say to me, hey, why are you trying to be here in this atmosphere without me? I want you to find just a couple other believers and I want you to start taking the first 15 minutes of the day and find just one verse of scripture to read together and just spend some time intentionally thanking me for the day. I had no clue what God was getting us into. Now, if you can't tell, I come from a Pentecostal charismatic background. I'm trying to behave. 
And so if you can imagine four of us Pentecostal, charismatic, tongue-talking believers in, in the hallway of Chase praying. And this is one of those moments where we didn't ask for permission. We said, you know what, let's just start doing it. And if we get in trouble, we say, oh, you know, we didn't know we weren't allowed. But to our surprise, the, the vice president on our floor comes out and says, hey guys, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. You know, want to start your day with a little prayer. Appreciate that, but you're being kind of loud. People are trying to get their work done. Would you rent out the conference room the next time you want to do this? We said, rent out, rent out the conference room? We're allowed to do that? And so that's what we did. We rented out the conference room. This is 2010, 2012. And over a short period of time, 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 70 people from all different backgrounds and denominations committed to meeting for 15 minutes in the morning. Now listen, the, the, the smokers got two 15-minute breaks a day plus their lunch break. So my thing was like, hey, if they're allowed to get two 15-minute breaks a day plus their lunch break, we can come and spend some time with the Holy Ghost for 15 minutes in the morning and it'll be all right. And it grew and we ended up taking communion together. It was powerful. And then what, what, what you saw is guys were asking to get lunch and they were confessing their pornography addiction at work, seeking prayer. I remember a, a young girl in her 20s came to me and said, I haven't been to church since I was eight years old with my grandma and she died and she was my only connection to faith. How do I start my relationship with God again? In the marketplace, that terrifies the devil. When we're all in our, in our church buildings, it's worship, it's glorifying. God, don't get me wrong. God loves it. He's called us to do this. But the devil's got us all in one place. And he knows when our hour and a half service is going to be over, that for many of us, we're not going to intentionally engage with our faith and, and intentionally walk out all that God has called us to until the next Sunday. But he doesn't know what to do when every place he's given you influence Monday through Saturday is no longer safe because you're going to bring the glory of God. You're going to bring the spirit of God and the word of God into that place. He doesn't know what to do with that. And that little prayer and worship community grew to several people, as I mentioned there, and then it spread to five other buildings. One started at Cardinal Health. And when I left Chase, in 2012, five years later, in 2017, there were still groups meeting. We had no person in charge. It was decentralized leadership. We just committed to host the presence of the Lord at our job. And when the Lord told me to quit, I cried like a baby. Because I had the best of both worlds. I was making six figures and seeing God show up. And then I started working for the church. <laughs> and I'll just say... I was no longer making six figures. That's all I'll say about that. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've called me to do. Amen. Let's wrap this up. Let's look at Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. What's the point that I want you to walk away with from this? section. We learned that in God's perfect design, when man was walking in perfect relationship with God, perfect righteousness, perfect holiness, sin has not entered the picture yet. In that state, freedom still included boundaries. But in the perfected state of the Garden of Eden, before sin ever entered into the picture, freedom still included boundaries. You can eat this tree, but you can't eat of this one. Freedom demanded trust in God's leadership. Freedom demanded obedience. And disobedience was the greatest threat to that freedom and came with great consequences. So here's my question. Are you submitting daily to the leadership of the Lord? Are you experiencing the joy of freedom that is the result of trusting and obeying the boundaries that the Lord has given us to keep us from sin and its consequences? When was the last time you felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit and yielded to it? That he pointed out that particular way of thinking, that behavior, and said, that doesn't line up with the kingdom. I want to talk to you about that. And notice I said conviction, not condemnation. What's the difference? Conviction comes with hope, mercy, and grace. Condemnation will leave you feeling hopeless and it will keep your eyes on your sin where conviction will point your eyes to your Savior and will remind you of the price that he paid to set you free and will empower you 
to overcome that thing you're tripping over. That's what conviction will lead you to. Are you experiencing the correction of your heavenly father? Knowing that he only corrects his kids. I've never spanked a child that doesn't belong to me. That would be weird and illegal. And I would go to jail. I may have wanted to spank some other people's children, but I refrained because they're not mine. Experiencing the correction of the Lord is a part of the evidence that you belong to him. Oh, that we would fall in love with his correction because we know that it's good for us. As we close, I want to look at Genesis 2, 18 through 25, and I'm going to paraphrase it. But God, for the first time, says it is not good. In no other time in the creation narrative have we heard those words come out, come out of his mouth. We've only heard, it is good, it is good. And then when he made man, he said it was very good. But now he's saying, for the first time, it's not good. What is he saying? It's not good for man to be alone. And we see God initiate this plan to provide a comparable helper for Adam. And, and then he asks Adam to partner with him in the creation process by naming all of the animals of the field and naming all the animals, the, the birds of the sky. But in the midst of all of them, there was not found a, a helpmate, a helper comparable to Adam. And so God puts Adam to sleep and he takes a rib from his side and out of that rib, he brings to Adam a bride comparable to him. And in verse 25, it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. What's so powerful about this, in my opinion, is not just the picture that we're seeing of marriage for the first time. I officiated a wedding yesterday, and, and this whole section of scripture is powerful to read at a wedding. But if this was only speaking to what it would be like to walk this earth with a spouse, every single person would have the right to ignore this passage of scripture. I'd like to make a suggestion that, that this is one of the prophetic pictures that's pointing to God's heart to provide a bride for his son. And in the same way that Adam's rib was removed from his side, there was a wound on his side our king, our bridegroom king would go to the cross and experience receiving a wound on his side that was necessary for a comparable bride to be produced for him. The father is eager and will not stop until there is a bride sufficient for his son. And this passage is pointing to that. And in that same way that Adam was partnering with the plan of God, we as the bride of, of Jesus Christ, we are going to partner with him when he returns and he establishes the fullness of the kingdom. We will rule and reign with Jesus in the new heavens, in the new earth. He's looking for a bride that identifies with that assignment and will help him with it. That's our eternal destiny. You say, how are you so sure of this? Well, my Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, so it was written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, a living spirit, a life-giving spirit. My Bible tells me in Romans 5, 12, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Verse 15, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? If Jesus is the last Adam, the perfected Adam, we are the last Eve, the perfected Eve that is growing up to be the mature, spotless, blameless, righteous, holy, sufficient bride for Jesus Christ. In the same way that we read that, that Eve and Adam lived together, naked, vulnerable, open, innocent, and free from shame. This is the heart of Jesus for his bride. That we would understand that through his blood and resurrection, we now have no reason to cover ourselves when we come into his presence. But we can live naked, open, vulnerable, 
intimate. We can live under a renewed innocence. We can live before our bridegroom king, our husband, our Lord, free of shame. Close your eyes with me. Lord, I don't know what part of this message spoke to your sons and daughters today. Maybe it was the beginning and it was just hearing the invitation for the first time that they were not created to identify with their purpose separate from pleasure in you and with you. Maybe what stuck out to them today was the invitation that their Monday through Saturday is meant to be worship and that through the blood of Jesus, their work has been redeemed and that your desire, wherever it is that you've given them influence, is to do what they have been called and assigned to do Monday through Saturday unto you with the expectation of deep fulfillment and delight. And that they're going to they're gonna go into Monday and this week with a whole new lens of what they're there to do. God, maybe what they heard is this, this invitation to be the, the righteous, purified bride, but they say, how? I don't feel righteous most days. I don't feel clean most days. I don't feel holy most days. How could I be the comparable bride to such a perfect and holy God, to such a perfect and a holy King, Jesus, my Lord? And right now in this moment by your spirit, you want to touch them, to show them that the righteousness and the holiness and the blamelessness that they're being asked to identify with does not find its source in them, but it finds its source in the blood of Jesus. I don't know what one of those things is speaking to your heart, but I'm asking you, as this worship team begins to play, talk to him, talk to him. Don't let this just be another Sunday. Talk to him. Let him encounter you. Let him touch you where you need to be touched. Take that first step by simply engaging in the dialogue. Ask him for what you need. Let this be the moment that you admit that he doesn't satisfy you. And so many other things satisfy you. Let this be the moment. You're honest about that and watch him right in. Watch him right in. Let this be the moment that you get a vision, a blueprint, a strategy to start a presence and word group at your job and find one or two other Christians that you'll just commit to praying and worshiping with on your job. Let this be the moment that you stop walking in the shame of past sin that he sets you free from and receive your identity as the holy, beloved bride that he's called you to be. In Jesus' name.